my degrees are only in the arts, so I have the faintest idea about anything medical except for the fact that I have a son who is a doctor and the head of a department at Soroka. Uh, that's as, as near as I get. However, I will tell you what we are told. Dr. Simon Wiseman is a general practitioner who has a range of interests having worked in several fields, including addiction, teaching medical students and qualified doctors, and clinical risk management. He uh, has served on various medical committees, including the United Kingdom's Jewish Medical Association. And, and then we get to the topic. As you will have seen if you received a notice, Berlin to Dachau, internment and return. The life and times of Dr. Max Gluck, gentleman I've not heard of before, but no doubt we will learn a great deal. The topic I wanted to just mention is especially relevant because of the impending date of International Holocaust Memorial Day, which is this coming Friday, I believe. Um, I would also like to mention the fact that I didn't know this beforehand, that Dr. Wiseman uh, recently made Aliyah and is living in Jerusalem. Uh, right, so um, I think I've done enough briefly to give you some idea of the lecture uh, and we will learn more now from him about the topic. Dr. Wiseman. I'm going to try and manage without. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, so I'm going to start by just giving a few introductory remarks about alcohol. So in 1987, the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom published a book called The Great and Growing Evil, The Medical Consequences of Alcohol Abuse. Now this was not the first occasion that the college felt it necessary to draw to the public's attention a harm caused by alcohol abuse. In 1726, it made a submission to the House of Commons on a great and growing evil, later to be portrayed by Hogarth in his engraving of Gin Lane in 1751. Anyway, the um, situation of alcohol abuse in the 1800s was portrayed by um, Hogarth in his engraving of Gin Lane. Uh, I don't think I'm going to win with this tonight. There's actually this one here. Yeah, I was doing that before. Anyway, let's see. Um, so let me just set this, the current scene in the UK um, and I should add that my experience is essentially UK based um, with some statistics about alcohol related problems. So in the UK, there, in England, there are an estimated 600,000 dependent drinkers and only 18% of these people are having or receiving treatment. 24% of adults in England and Scotland regularly drink over the Chief Medical Officer's low risk guidelines. And in the UK, data shows that in 2020, around 9,000 people, uh, there are around 9,000 alcohol specific deaths, and that's about 14 per 100,000. Alcohol misuse is the biggest risk factor for death, ill health and disability among 15 to 49 year olds in the UK and the fifth biggest risk factor across all ages. In terms of alcohol and health, alcohol is a causal factor in more than 60 medical conditions. To name a few, cancers of the mouth, throat, stomach, liver and breast, high blood pressure, cirrhosis of the liver, depression, and a whole range of psychiatric problems. And in England, in 2019, 2020, 
there were just under a million hospital admissions related to alcohol consumption, and the highest since the records began. <coughs> there are regional variations, uh, being higher in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and higher in men compared to women. Just as an aside, what about Jewish alcoholics and addicts? There have always been Jewish alcoholics and addicts. Whatever the number, what's important is the recognition of the problem that it's there and getting, pre and getting prevention and treatment to the community is required. Denial and stigmatization has been prevalent for decades. Probably the incidence of alcohol and substance abuse uh, has been lower amongst Jews, but is likely to be rising. Now let me turn to the subject of my talk. And it's the middle slide on the bottom there is the picture of Dr. Max Glatt. Let me start with a little of my own history with Dr. Max Meyer Glatt. Our first meeting was when I was a medical student at University College Hospital Medical School around 1970. I was doing my undergraduate psychiatric attachment and we were offered a one-off session to sit in in the drug dependence clinic which had been set up by Dr. Blatt and a University College Hospital based psychiatrist in 1967. I remember turning up not really knowing what to expect and on that occasion I was the only student to attend. The clinic was rowdy and there was security. I was directed to a room with the anticipation of observing the consultations. The doctor I sat in with was a well-dressed, dapper-looking man with a moustache, speaking in German-accented English who was very self-effacing. To my surprise, the doctor, who was Max Glatt, began to involve me in the consultations. When in discussion with him later, I suggested I wasn't sure what I was doing, he more or less indicated that no one else did either. <laughs> he fascinated me with his attitude and approach, and at the end of that session, um, I asked if I could come back the following week because I was so interested. And this was the beginning of my interest in the field of addiction. And I continued to attend the clinic every time Dr. Glatt was there. Additionally, I visited the alcohol treatment unit that he ran at St. Bernard's Hospital in Ealing. And this was the start of my contact with Max Glatt, who became my teacher, my mentor, and one of the most influential people in my career. He had this ability to engage with people, whatever their background, and was always self-deprecating. Let me share a few anecdotes about Dr. Glatt. I mean, he was a pioneer in the treatment of alcoholism and drug addiction, both nationally in the UK and internationally. And we'll come on to that in more detail in due course. I should add at this stage, he was probably about 10 or 15 years older than uh, Dr. Abraham, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky. So he predates Dr. Tversky, Rabbi Tversky. Um, in 1973, he set up the first prison alcoholism unit in Wormwood Scrubs Prison in West London. in 1973. The prisoners loved him and named their football team the Glatt Dynamos. <laughs> His son told me he won the confidence of the prisoners by beating them at table tennis. He should have become himself a table tennis player and played in his youth the world champion in his, in his younger days. That player said to him, you must make up your mind if you want to become the world number one or do something useful. <laughs> At which point he resumed his studies in earnest. In his self-effacing modest manner, he would say, 
Here is this Jewish refugee from Germany who comes to England, gets interned to Australia, and what do they do? They name a prison unit and a prison football team after me. <laughs> Whenever a drug addict he was treating was making good progress and was able to come off their drugs, he would always say, what's the catch? He would never attribute it to his own therapeutic input. A bit of biographical information. Dr. Glatt was born on the 26th of January, 1912. His family was prosperous and middle class and lived in Bulostrasse, just outside central Berlin. I don't know if I can get anything. Oh. It's not great, I'm afraid, but it helps. And you can see a picture top left of Bulostrasse and the surrounding area in slide nine. His father was a director of an insurance company. He claimed, apparently, that he drifted into medicine as a young Berliner who really wanted to become a journalist, but didn't know how. Nevertheless, Max was destined for a prestigious academic career in medicine. However, it was practically impossible for a Jew to gain a university appointment. He was thrown out of Berlin University in 1934, because of the rising tide of anti-Semitism, and from month to month didn't know what was going to happen. Despite all this, he completed his medical studies in Leipzig University. But he needed to, somebody, he needed to find somebody to supervise him to give him a topic for a thesis for his MD. At that time, no German professor would dare to help until he arrived at the charity hospital at slide 10, where he was accepted by Professor Karl Bonhoeffler, who supported a Jewish colleague. And slide 11 is the modern building of the charity hospital. It's been around for about 300 years. He completed his MD thesis on the topic of the treatment of syphilis and the causation of general paralysis of the insane GPI caused by late onset syphilis. It appears he should have left Germany after he was awarded his doctorate but delayed his departure. After Kristallnacht in 1938, he was captured by frontier guards trying to escape to Holland and was taken to Dachau. He was released in 1939, apparently not knowing the reason, and then came to England. Now, one of, one of our neighbors where we live is Ephraim Zurov, who is director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem. I discussed this with him, and he felt at that time, 38, 39, the policy really was to expel Jews at that time. So this may well have been the reason in Max's case. He later learnt that his parents had been taken to a concentration camp in Estonia where they were murdered. The only other member of his family to survive was his sister who had been smuggled to Holland. I'm actually very pleased to see and meet tonight her son, Mr. Metz, who's hopefully confirming some of what I'm talking about. <laughs> In England in 1940, because he had a German passport, he was classified as an enemy alien and interned and sent to Australia, probably on the De Niro, um, coming back to the UK in 1942, when his medical career took off and stretched over 60 years. So in 1942, he was given a position in the emergency medical service. At that time, general hospitals were evacuated to mental hospitals in the suburbs, and he was working at Cane Hill, a large mental hospital in Surrey. He was a resident medical officer in charge of four general wards with mainly medical and surgical patients. After about three or four weeks, Max felt he didn't have enough work to do. 
and asked whether he could do any surgical or medical work on the psychiatric side of the hospital. He said, I remember him telling me this, the hospital superintendent must have thought him an idiot who'd not learnt the first rule that one never volunteers. His interests were really in general medicine, especially in neurology and cardiology, but he didn't have any English degrees nor any useful English connections. Around 1947-48, when he was naturalised, he'd been working in psychiatric hospitals for several years, so he thought he'd try to obtain his diploma in psychological medicine, the DPM first, and then perhaps get back into general medicine. Having then got the DPM, he thought, well, perhaps he should find out a bit more about psychiatry and from a progressive mental hospital. And that's why in 1951, he went to Wallingham Park Hospital. There, he became interested in group therapy. And the groups in which he took part dealt mainly with various neurotic conditions, but also there were a few alcoholics. He said he knew nothing about alcoholism. But the alcoholics struck him as interesting people with wide experience and they were good talkers. But somehow they did not fit in with what was happening in the groups where they were placed. He remembered one patient who'd been a successful stockbroker and he'd been put into Wallingham Park Hospital by his family firm on the condition that he'd do something about his drinking and if he didn't come out after six months being cured, he would be sacked. So this highly intelligent man went along to the various doctors in the hospital and asked each one of them what they did about alcoholism. And none of them knew what to answer. And he was told, there's nothing we can do. There was also a dentist who'd also been at Wallingham several times, and he cut a lonely figure, a nice, intelligent man who just walked around all day long with his books, hardly talking to anybody. He came back again and again. There was also a memory of a man who was admitted 11 times, usually in delirium tremens, DTs, as a result of alcohol withdrawal. They all enjoyed Wallingham Park, which under the then superintendent, a Dr. T.P. Rees, was a liberal, pulsating, active community, but they relapsed again and again. Finally, it occurred to Max that he had nothing much to lose if he put some of the drinkers in Wallingham in their own group. And this was around June 1952, and he found three other pa patients to join the stockbroker. They sat around talking about various things for an hour or so, and at the end of the session, Dr. Glatt asked them whether they wanted to meet again. They all said, well, they really did not think what was offered by him was other than a waste of time. But, compared to the even more boring occupational therapy making better and bigger elephants, there was no harm in wasting another hour. And so they had another meeting, a second meeting, and it was clear that something was happening. Max didn't know what was happening, and he said he still didn't have a clue about alcoholism. Yet within a short period of time, they got in touch with Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, and those four people became the nucleus of the first AA group in the Croydon area. From these early beginnings, the first alcohol treatment unit was started in the United Kingdom in 1952. Modelled on group therapy, the formation of an AA group in the hospital, and patients writing and presenting their life stories to other patients in a group setting. Unfortunately, you can't see it, and it's a shame, um, but there's uh, a cartoon that was done of you can only see the top part in 13, um, of Max with a, a group with somebody presenting their life story. 
writing your own life story is quite a salutary experience and then having to present it to other people is very very challenging and in some ways extremely therapeutic additionally on the unit there were ex-patient reunions and a magazine written by patients past and present Dr. Glatt had an intense clinical involvement and his interest had always been mainly clinical, but he also liked teaching and doing some clinical research. At that time in Wallingham, the alcoholics were only a relatively small part of his duties. Nevertheless, at that time he wasn't married, he lived in the hospital and didn't take many weekends off. He remembered most of the names of the old Wallingham Park alcoholic patients at the time and remained quite friendly with quite a few of them. From the very beginning, the chaplain had a group, the social worker had a group, the nurses had a group, and all the great ideas about interdisciplinary teamwork were obvious already to anybody taking trouble to listen to what patients had to say. He had an outpatient group in 1952 and saw them in outpatients from the very beginning. Max was modestly insistent he learned from his patients and he began publishing articles which gave a coherent view of the possibilities of National Health Service treatment for alcoholism centered on specialized units. He was offering a new model of alcoholism treatment, although it may have been borrowed from the neurosis unit and from the model of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, having met these alcoholics, he still really didn't know anything much about alcoholism, but soon found that the great men in British psychiatry didn't have a clue either. Mm -hmm. He realized how much these people and their families were suffering, and then they didn't seem to be anybody around to help them. Not only did no one have an answer, hardly anybody really seemed to care, apart from Alcoholics Anonymous and the members of the Society for the Study of Addiction. He felt that one ought to do something, and although he didn't feel he was doing very much, in his modest way he would say that, he could at least say there was one place in the country which was trying to do something. Because of the interest shown by patients, their families, Alcoholics Anonymous, probation officers, churches, magistrates, there was a feeling there was an obvious need for this type of experimental work and it ought to spread further afield. There were lots of visitors to the alcoholic groups coming from abroad, from the USA and from Europe, and they too were becoming very interested. The British Medical Association, the BMA, and Magistrates Committee became involved together with the Ministry of Health. He later became involved with the World Health Organization, WHO, and their expert committees. In 1955, he published what was really a landmark article in The Lancet showing that alcoholic patients could be cooperative, respond to group therapy, and stable when sober. Additionally, Dr. Glatt became interested in drug problems. And one of the first things he stated that he learned about drug problems from the patients was that many patients felt that if you gave them one tablet, four tablets would do them four times as well. From 1953 onwards, he was seeing quite a few barbiturate and amphetamine addicts of Wallingham, mainly middle-class females patients. There was the occasional narcotic addict, mainly doctors, several years before the new wave of young addicts came along in the early 1960s. In 1967, with Dr. Rodder Treadgold, a consultant psychiatrist, he opened an outpatient addiction center at University College Hospital, and this was a year before the National Health Service drug addiction clinics opened. There was one earlier center at Westminster Hospital. But when he was at St. Bernard's Hospital in Ealing, there was a picture, number 
14 and 15 of St. Bernard's Hospital. I'm sorry about the lack of uh, magnification. Um, he moved there in 1958 as a consultant psychiatrist. Nobody knew where to send, send these young addicts. And as St. Bernard's Hospital had a large alcoholism unit, they were already taking some barbiturate and amphetamine users. They sent these young addicts from about 19, they sent them there from about 1961 onwards. They put them together with the alcoholics and they did fit despite all the differences in personality, age, social and economic circumstances and pharmacological agents. But after a while they began to have separate group sessions for the young narcotic addicts on the one hand and on the other hand for the alcoholics and the more middle-aged sedative and amphetamine users though keeping them together in the same ward. And that started around 1962, and the aim was to get the narcotic, get them off narcotics completely within about a week and then start group therapy. As I mentioned, he moved to St. Bernard's Hospital in Southall in 58, and this was previously known as the Hanwell Asylum, which is mentioned in George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. Another interesting fact I found, St. Bernard was a 12th century abbot, a mystic, and a co-founder of the Knights Templar. Dr. Glatz Ward expanded to take 60 inpatients, both alcoholics and drug addicts. And one of the debates in the management of alcoholism is whether the question of normal drinking can be achieved by former alcohol addicts. Dr. Glatt thought that while it was theoretically possible, it would be unlikely to return to normal drinking. Initially, when alcoholics came to see him and said they wanted to drink in moderation, he would probably say he couldn't help them, he wished them luck in trying to achieve that goal. But from about 1962 onwards, when treating middle-class alcoholics in his private practice, if they said, they wanted to aim for controlled drinking, he said to them, whatever he did or didn't believe, there were reliable research workers who said that it was possible. He would suggest try their own approach, and if they were not successful, to give another method of treatment a chance. They were advised to sip drinks, not gulp, not to drink alone, and especially not when depressed. There were patients who were able to control their drinking for a while, and he began to see the issue in terms of a variable threshold. If the patients were able to stay on the right side of the threshold, they might get away with drinking in moderation. And the debate raised the difficulty of trying to keep a fair balance between the two extremes, between on the one hand those people who said it was quite impossible, and certain sociologists and psychologists who claimed that normal drinking could almost become the rule. His position was that he believed that, in theory, every alcoholic could drink normally if the going remained good in three areas. In the area of the individual's personality, in the area of the work and the environment, and in the area of the agent and the drinking rules the individual employed. For instance, as far as the individual was concerned, this might mean drinking only when cheerful and contented, and not taking a drink as medication for one's nerves. In relation to the environment, it could mean drinking in the company of a spouse or partner or moderate drinkers only, and the drinking rules might be sipping wine or beer rather than gulping spirits. If the going remained good in all those areas, that person might go on drinking in a controlled way forever. But unfortunately, the spouse or partner sometimes does argue. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to listen to boring lectures. Unfortunately, your team doesn't always win their cricket and soccer matches. And one's boss does not always recognize what a wonderful person one is. <laughs> and given real life, while in theory, he didn't see any reason why it shouldn't be possible to return to normal drinking, because of the unlikelihood in reality of the varying circumstances in those three areas, 
he believed that what in theory was possible in practice was not all that likely. He tried looking around for these elusive controlled alcoholics for 20 years at least and kept in touch with many ex-patients and he would have thought sooner or later he might have met one of these cases but he didn't. Critics then say, perhaps rightly, that this is a result of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And although he didn't tell such patients at the first interview he didn't believe in alcoholics' normal drinking, they may perhaps have known or suspected his scepticism. Critics might also say that the results of a systemic behavioural approach aimed at normal drinking would be different from the results gained from his approach. Moving on, he was a founder member of the Medical Council on Alcohol, an alcohol and which was a, an educational charity, and this continues to go from strength to strength. Max noted that the doctors and dentists who were his patients were having difficulty attending Alcoholic Anonymous meetings as they found it embarrassing to sit with their patients. So in 1973, he persuaded them to found the British Doctors and Dentists Group, which has proved to be successful over the years. He was asked about the roots of his compassion, why he bothered to listen to patients with alcoholism <coughs> when others would not, and how he understood the origin and motivations of his involvement in the field of addiction. Typically, he started the answer by saying he didn't recognize himself as described by the interviewer. He did not feel he had a real answer. But he then went on to indicate that he had a high respect for alcoholics as individuals. And when he married, 20 recovered alcoholics were invited to his wedding. He went on to say that it's quite difficult to come back from nowhere in the face of an ostracizing society. He felt that often they were good, even great personalities. He continued his answer by mentioning that most of us pride ourselves that we care for the underdog. Having come from Germany as a refugee and seen what happened in that country to a minority left in the lurch and forgotten by everybody, whatever it was that happened in 1952 with the formation of the first alcohol treatment unit, something must have been in him beforehand. He always tended to side with the losers. When watching a football match, he always wanted the underdog to win. He felt guilty that he'd mis completely misjudged the alcoholics he met before 1952 when the treatment was in its embryonic form and just said, drink less or some statement such as that. He felt he'd done them wrong and society and everybody else was doing them wrong too. These were people who suffered and deserved help and nobody was doing anything. Perhaps, he stated, it was somebody's responsibility to open their mouth, even, or perhaps it was with a German accent and a, jo a Jewish refugee mentality and background. So when I qualified in medicine, my intention was to work full time in addiction. To achieve this aim meant to specialize in and train in general psychiatry and then concentrate on addiction. I did start off in general psychiatry, but after a while I decided to have a change of direction and went on to general practice, which I was fort fortunate enough to use as a base to further my interest in alcoholism and drug addiction. I was lucky enough with Dr. Glatt's encouragement to be able to get a post working on his treatment unit one day a week, and that went on for 15 years. This provided me with a platform to gain knowledge and skills in this area, undertake research, and become involved in teaching both undergraduates and qualified doctors. <coughs> in addition to his other roles, Max continued to see patients at the Drug Dependence Clinic at University College Hospital on Wednesday evenings, where I also had a session. And this clinic was held in slide 16 in what was formerly the National Temperance Hospital. 
In the 1960s, this became part of University College Hospital, having been set up in the 1800s by the Temperance Society. Uh, I have a certain affection for this part of the hospital as when I qualified, I was a house physician based at this part of the hospital. I don't know the history, but somebody with a sense of humor had persuaded one of the breweries to deliver cases of beer for the doctors in the hospital. <laughs> it's true. I'm afraid very alcoholic. <laughs> At that clinic, at the drug clinic, I recall that Dr. David Berry, Professor Elliot Berry, Elliot Berry's late father, also uh, worked for some time at that clinic. At the end of the clinic on the Wednesday evening, I would give Max a lift home to Hendon where he lived, and I had the pleasure of meeting his wife, Gisela. Um, I know there are some members of his family here tonight, and I'm very happy that they're here. I mean, she was an amazing character. She was a Holocaust survivor. She survived Auschwitz. She was a huge support and um, great help to Max. And his son, I got to know, Julian, who now lives in the USA. Max encouraged me to become a member of the Medical Council on Alcohol. That's this picture in slide 17. And um, I was one of the few GPs to serve on the executive uh, to represent primary care, which in the course of time has been shown to play an important part in managing alcohol-related problems. The experience of the Medical Council on Alcohol Organization was interesting, and it's gone from strength to strength. And there is an annual <coughs> lecture in Dr. Max Glatt's name which has been given by many em eminent people. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but it started in 2006, and most of the people are professors or dedicated people who work full-time in addiction or related areas. And they are given a medal. Can't see that either. Oh, maybe. That's number 20. <coughs> So to summarize, I had the good fortune to meet Dr. Max Blatt when I was a medical student. He was a fascinatingly interesting man whose background and life experiences led him to being a pioneering influence in changing the attitude towards patients with alcoholism and the treatment of addiction. His ability to relate to people from all walks of life was remarkable. To quote his successor, Dr. David Marjo, who took over the National Health Service Drug and Alcohol uh, Dependence Unit on his retirement, Max had an uncanny empathy with his patients. I think, I think that's it, it's gone. Okay. Um, and they were in awe of his ability to what they perceived as reading their minds. He was open-minded and had no fear of change. He always maintained a modesty that did not <coughs> match his achievements on an international level. He advised the UK government, the Home Office, the World Health Organization, the British Medical Association, Royal Colleges and other bodies. He was on the honorary staff of four teaching hospitals in London and had a profound effect on the clinical science and art of chemical dependence. He wrote prolifically and widely, published a number of books, and was the editor of the British Journal of Addiction. He also received many honorary degrees in the UK and abroad, including Germany, and was held in high esteem by his colleagues. When he was 65 in 1977, he retired from the National Health Service and continued almost till his death in 2002 at the age of 90 to go to the therapeutic unit at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. He had a wide private practice and advised a number of private facilities and organizations. The unit at St. Bernard's Hospital was named the Max Glatt Unit in his honor, and as I've said, the unit in Wormwood Scrubs Prison too. When he was 70, his family doctor died. 
and he asked me to be his GP. Now for me, this was really a tremendous privilege to look after this amazing doctor who I met in my medical training in my early 20s and became my teacher and mentor and incidentally gave advice to my son when he was undertaking his medical studies. To quote Dr. Marjo again, it is unlikely that anybody in the world saw as many alcohol and drug dependent patients as he had and he used his vast clinical experience to great good effect. He is one of that celestial band of whom one says we shall not see his like again. He remained a modest and gentle person with a sense of humour and a wry smile. He was faithful to his orthodox Judaism and was a member of Hendon Adash Shaw, devoted to his family and his work. I think the quotation suggested by Rabbi Daniel Sinclair from Mishle, Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 aptly describes Dr. Max Meyer Glatt. Preed Sadek Eitz Chaim V'lokeach Nefoshos Kocham. Rabbi Steinzaltz translates this quotation with his added comments as follows. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and one who gathers souls educating and taking care of them is wise. The wise invest in what is truly important, which is people. Thank you. It is our custom to uh, invite questions. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes. Oh, that's a change. Um, right. Uh, Anybody has questions, would they please identify themselves first of all so we know who they are? Gentleman here. <laughs> well, I'm just checking to see if you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, fascinating uh, story um, and a, a fascinating uh, individual. I was very interested to hear that he managed to study at Leipzig. Um, Jews were expelled from German universities. Um, certainly by 1934. Um, but I heard recently about uh, somebody who'd actually also gone to Leipzig. Um, did he ever talk about this uh, this period? It was it really was unusual. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I can't add anything to that. I've not found any additional information about that. But you're right, you're right. And that he would be fortunate when he came back from Australia the wartime emergency regulations allowed foreign doctors to be placed on a temporary register which was made a permanent register at the end of the war so he would have been able with his German MD um, to to enter the National Health Service without a, without a problem. That was Dr. Collins, by the way. <laughs> Next question. <I> <laughs> Jewish answer and say yes and no. <laughs> um, there are overriding similarities in terms of some of the characteristics, but they, own, they all had their own individual uh, issues which were slightly different. But in terms of dependence, if you go sort of looking at dependence, obviously there, there, are, there are basic principles that they share. On my, on my own personal experience in, in dealing over the years with alcoholics and drug addicts, I, I, found, I found it, for me personally, I can't say it's easier, I found it m more, I found it myself more able to, to deal with alcoholics than, than drug addicts, although I treated both. But I preferred dealing with alcoholics if I, if I was pushing the corner into a disaster. That was good. Yes. Oh, sorry. David. David Young. David Young. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we Jews pride ourselves. We're not alcoholics. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> is this true? No, it's not true. Statistically, do it's Jews as a group have a lower percentage well, than others? Historically, I think that's correct. I mean, it's difficult. There are some studies. Um, generally, it's thought that statistics are that it is lower in Jews, but with increasing assimilation and integration in society, the rate is probably going up. Whether it's reached the levels of the surrounding society, probably not, but it, it, to think that Jews aren't alcoholics or drug addicts is, is just not right. May I just add something? Um, it's a fairly well known fact that in Eastern Europe, the Jews almost had control of the al alcoholic industry. They produced nearly all the liquor that the peasants especially cracked up. And um, whether this had an influence on the Jews here and themselves, I don't think so. I don't think it made them into and they great ran, drinkers. They ran the in-houses as well. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's just reminded that. Uh, gentlemen at the back, next please. Uh, my name is Jeff Lazar. Do you, do you think that Dr. Gluck was appreciated more internationally than he was in England? It's a very good question. He won an awful lot of uh, awards from Germany and from France and from all over. And he wasn't really, I mean, he should have been somebody much greater. He should have had greater recognition. I agree with you. And, um, I, I'm uncertain as to why. I have some theories, but maybe I'm here. I'm going to be diplomatic and not share them in public. I'll talk to you afterwards, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen here, yeah, next please. Uh, Matt. I'm, I'm Dr. Garth Sinesh here. Uh, <clears throat> just a, not a question, a comment on the previous question. He often uh, made the remark that that's a, a function uh, where food and drink was served. You could see all the 